thank you for joining us for our first Forward Thinking Speaker Series event of 2020. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered on Treaty 6 territory. Together we acknowledge the many First Nations, Inuit and Métis whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. I would also like to welcome a few special guests in attendance, including councillors Ben Henderson, Sarah Hamilton, and the newest addition to the EPL Board of Trustees, Councillor Andrew Knack. They are joined with EPL Board Chair Fern Snart and uh, fellow trustee Sandra Marin. EPL started our Forward Thinking Speaker Series in 2014, and over the past six years, we've hosted more than 30 events, sharing diverse ideas and perspectives to sold out audiences, surpassing over 17,000 attendees. Our goal is how it has always been, to inspire you, to make you think critically, to incite dynamic discussions, and our ultimate goal is to improve our community and our society. This makes the topic of this evening even uh, more special because we are inviting Don Iveson and a panel of youth leaders to dive into what it will take to build a better community and a better city. These diverse and thought-provoking conversations are made possible with support from our generous sponsors, which includes our partner for this evening, the City of Edmonton, along with event partner CPA Alberta and our media sponsor for the last three years, Avenue Magazine. I'd like you to join me in welcoming Ray Rachel Kaharski, board member of the Chartered Professional Accountants of Alberta and partner at Deloitte, as she comes up to say a few words. So thank you, Tina, and good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here today on behalf of CPA Alberta, representing the more than 29,000 Chartered Professional Accountants, or CPAs, in our province. CPA Alberta is proud to sponsor EPL's first Forward Thinking Speaker Series event of 2020. And that is a mouthful. <laughs> Alberta CPAs work for and truly with Albertans. We are committed to making Alberta a better place to live by serving as leaders in our communities and helping businesses throughout the province grow and thrive. Through events like this, and indeed through most everything they do, EPL helps build better organizations, neighborhoods, and communities. CPA Alberta knows that innovation, learning, and inspiration are also key to building a great province. We're proud to support EPL and their work to bring insightful and vital discussions about issues that affect all citizens. So I'm really excited to be here tonight. I think we're going to have a great evening. I'm going to turn it back to Tina so we can hear from Mayor Don Iveson and our fabulous panel. Thank you, Rachel. Um, we all know our city has changed tremendously in just the past few short years, so it's hard to imagine what it's going to look like over the next few decades. Today, as I said, we're joined by Mayor Don Iveson and youth leaders to discuss what it'll take to build the Edmonton of tomorrow and how we can plan for a city that will provide generations a bright economic future. To introduce our guest panel and guide us through the discussion, I am pleased to uh, introduce Ryan Jesperson. Ryan talks news, politics, and pop culture as the host of The Ryan Jesperson Show on Edmonton's 630 Ched. Recognized as one of Alberta's top 50 most influential people by Alberta Venture and as one of Edmonton's top 40 under 40 by Avenue Magazine in their inaugural list, I think Don Iveson was in that one as well, Ryan has established himself as a next generation mover and shaker in Edmonton's capital city. While Ryan and the mayor and our panel of youth leaders make their way to the stage, please direct your attention to the screens and watch a short video about Edmonton's city plan. When I think about the big decisions that we're making at City Hall, we're building a city for the next generation. And all the work that I do is building the kind of city that my kids are going to want to choose to stay in. You should start thinking because it's going to come faster than you think. Because the future is important, you have to be prepared for it. Welcome everyone to the uh, beautiful Trifo Theatre and, and thank you for being here with, tonight, with us tonight. As mentioned, my name is Ryan Jesperson and it, it's a real honor to be uh, acting as your moderator tonight. 
uh, for tonight's events. Uh, I probably don't need to introduce the individual sitting to my right, your left, but I shall since his election as Edmonton's 35th mayor, hard to leave seven years ago already, back in 2013. Uh, mayor Don Iveson has led Edmonton's transformation into a more uplifting, resilient, and globally competitive city. Uh, alongside his remarkable partner, Sarah Chan, they both serve our community while raising two young kids, uh, working to make things better for all of our children, our grandchildren as well. Harnessing a new confidence among Edmontonians, Mayor Iveson is focused on the priorities of growing an opportunity economy building a more family-friendly city, accelerating our leadership on energy and climate, and planning for a million people, or tonight too, all while strengthening integrity and performance at City Hall. Uh, prior to entering public life, uh, Mayor Iveson studied political science right here at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, then served as president of the Canadian University Press in Toronto. He returned home to a city that appeared to be uh, exporting young, smart leaders, thinkers, creators, and entrepreneurs faster then it could attract them. And as a proud Edmontonian, the challenge of attracting and retaining more people inspired Iveson to run for city council back in 2007. As a result, one of his key performance indicators as both a councillor and mayor is to build the kind of city that when the time comes, his children will never want to leave. Mayor Don Iveson, thanks for being here. Kaylin Kufajanak is, is a young city builder currently working as a planner at Stan Tech and completing her Bachelor of Arts in Planning at the University of Alberta. She volunteers as a board member for Paths for People and is an avid year-round cyclist. You're one of those maniacs we see out in minus 25. Yeah, way to go. Uh, <laughs> as a 21-year-old as a who grew up right here in Alberta's capital city, she is passionate about empowering young people to shape how their city evolves for its next million people. So a BA and uh, a major in planning, a minor in economics, a planning intern at Stantec, a board member at Paths for People, a volunteer with the Urban Land Institute and chair of the City of Edmonton's Youth Council from September 2018 to August 2019. Please welcome Kaylin Kufajanakis. <laughs> It was, uh, it was a real pleasure to reconnect with Robin Taylor tonight. Robin and I first met, I think, about five years ago, wasn't it, at the Alberta legislature when, when you were there as a page? Yeah. And uh, Robin's been an engaged citizen for many years now, uh, a student at the University of Alberta, reading for a degree in economics and biological sciences. She's always made it her goal uh, to be an active member of the community and to give back wherever and whenever she can. So to do so, she's currently serving as the social equity chair on the city of Edmonton's Youth Council and a program coordinator for the Youth Collective. Uh, Yeg the Come Up. Uh, Robin is passionate about the empowerment of Edmonton's diverse African and Caribbean young communities, as well as making the city a desirable place for young people to live and prosper. She's excited to see the work done here with the city plan and is honored to speak on this panel today. Please welcome Robin Taylor. We'd like to thank those of you that, upon registering for this event, took the opportunity to provide questions, to submit questions for our panelists. We will be getting to those a little bit later on in this program, and then we will be opening up the floor to questions after that. We expect a robust and inspiring conversation, but first, we've asked our panelists to prepare a few thoughts for us here tonight, and we'll begin with His Worship, Mayor Iveson. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Ryan. It's great to be with you all here tonight, and good evening. And uh, I want to thank the library for this opportunity. Thanks, CPA, for supporting the library and supporting bringing us here tonight. Uh, thank you for, for moderating. Thank Kaylin and Robin for agreeing to be part of this discussion, which I think in and of itself uh, starts to answer the question, who are we doing all this for? Why are we having these conversations as a community? And I'll loop back around to that in a second, but I, I also want to acknowledge uh, Councillors Henderson, Hamilton, Knack, and Walters uh, who are with us here tonight. Is there anybody else who I missed? I'm looking out over this crowd and I realize I know half of you, so I apologize in advance because some of you are going to say, I've heard him say this before. Um, but it bears repeating because these are some of the most important intergenerational decisions our community is making right now. And uh, so it's just fitting to have uh, the next generation of leaders represented up here on this stage. And it was one of the, one of the great joys of my time as a city councillor, and I know Councillor Knack would agree as uh, uh, one of the current uh, um, councillors working with 
the Youth Council and with NextGen, that to the opportunity to connect with uh, people who see a 50 or 60 or 70 year runway of future for the city and then plug into that kind of um, uh, breadth of, and depth of vision um, really helps shake you out of the short termism of the next council meeting, the, the next uh, budget, the next election cycle and we need decision makers at all levels to be plugged into that kind of long term thinking as we uh, deal with real complexity but also sees real opportunity that's out there. And so in, on that theme of the next generation, I, I just want to really emphasize how much I care about our library that I am here and not watching Picard right now. Um, <laughs> but I'll watch it when I get home on delay. And, uh, uh, and, and I was thinking about this from, uh, uh, from a couple different perspectives, obviously um, the future, but we need to situate this in a little bit of historical context. And I got a gift this afternoon um, uh, by having the chance to speak at the retirement for a gentleman named Peter Ohm, who some of you will know as, uh, up until very recently, the chief planner at the city of Edmonton. And I've learned a ton from Peter uh, over more than a decade working together. And he had the chance uh, to reflect at the end of the program on the change he's seen in this city since he started in 1985 and the kind of city that as um, a young boy moving here from Medicine Hat and then beginning to travel the world and seeing what other great cities of the world are like, what motivated him to become a planner and dedicate a 35, career, a 35 year career of public service to this city and how the city has changed and what lies ahead. And so it was just marvelous to be able to send off someone who's given so much of themselves uh, to this community and this region and to the profession over a generation as we reflect on what it's going to take to build the city for the next 30 to 35 years, during which time a million people are going to show up here, give or take. So, but I want to go back even further than the mid-80s in Edmonton because I think there's an even deeper historical context than that. Um, and it's really the history of human uh, civic civilization. And for at least 5,000 years that we can kind of track, um, human beings have been perfecting this technology that we call cities. And if you think about it, it's actually one of the enabling mechanisms for almost everything that makes life really cool and really exciting and really possible and really safe and really healthy. Um, so cities are these remarkable places where you have the aggregation of human talent and creativity and resources and capital and markets and opportunities. And when you mash all of that together, cities have this math and people are starting to figure out that there is, there is an exponential math to cities. And this is why they matter. This is why they've been changing history for millennia. And they matter now more than ever with more than half the world's population living in cities and we're on track to three quarters of the world's population living in cities. Uh, Mike Bloomberg, former mayor of New York and now presidential candidate, who's the only the second mayor I know who's running for president of the United States. I've got to meet some pretty cool people <coughs> in my time as mayor. Mike puts it really well. He says, uh, the big problems are in the cities, but the people are in the cities, and the people have the solutions, and so that's where we're going to change the world. And I really believe in that, and I really believe that Edmonton has, uh, for many years, and can into the future, play an outsized role for all kinds of reasons that have to do with our universities and Nate and um, the creativity of this community. For so many reasons, I really do think this is an exceptional place that's contributed a lot to the world and has even more to contribute. And as the math really starts to take off over the next generation, as this place continues to grow and thrive, I think making sure we get that right is critically, critically important. Now the second premise I want to establish about this place in particular is uh, that we value connection here. And that's going to come up over and over again. It is, you know, division is bad for business, except on the ice, and especially if you're playing in Calgary. <laughs> Last night, I know, I'm not going to get into that. Um, <laughs> But outside of that, you know, downtown or suburban, tower or walk up, skinny home or short term shelter, informal settlement or brownstone, everybody needs a place to live. The million people who are here now 
the next million people, everybody needs a place to live. And they need things to do. They need opportunities to sustain themselves, to recreate, uh, to meet other people, to broaden their horizons and change the world, their little piece of it at a time. And so fortunately for us, and this is not true of everywhere, this is an all of us place, not an us and them place or a, a some of us place. It really is genuinely an, an all of us place. And it's a felt sense of connection, which I think you could call it social capital, you could call it a lot of different things, but it's also critical. And sometimes people say, and I, I'm not comfortable with this because it's sort of corny and a cliche, and I think we have to find a new way to talk about it, but people, I, I know what they mean and it's genuine when they say the city still feels like a small town and we don't want to lose that as we grow to two million people. And so that sense of connectedness, I think, is in the values of this place. And I could go all over the history of that and, and even how the founding stories of, of contact between uh, in different indigenous peoples before colonization and between um, settlers and explorers and indigenous people and the warm hospitality, like there's so much here uh, in the story of this place that speaks to that connection. So no wonder when we did our most recent strategic plan, it's called Connect Edmonton. And that theme emerged over and over and over from public engagement with people of all generations, but particularly strongly from young Edmontonians. And that's part of our, that's part of the magic of this place and what's gonna help us attract a million people and retain a million people here. But I also wanna situate this in a regional context because we're not just talking about the city, capital C, within the boundaries uh, of the, it's roughly a map of the city of Edmonton drawn with my fingers. Um, the city is uh, just a construct within a larger set of systems. Um, and it's a system full of systems, of course, and so it's highly, highly complex. But again, in this idea that it's not about uh, us versus them, you know, our neighbors, our immediate neighbors in this region, urban and rural, are inextricably part. Like, you can't physically move. Like, you can't get divorced from, from Parkland County. They keep trying, but <laughs> but they can't go anywhere, right? Like, we're, we're kind of stuck. Um, and so we should not just make the best of it. We should leverage the fact that, and, and so this, we call this in our conversations in the region, the metropolitan mindset. And we need the metropolitan mindset. I see Karen from EMRB. We're going to talk about this tomorrow with the mayors. We need it now more than ever uh, because people are getting divided in this urban-rural wedge. You see this in the United States, and it's ripping that country apart and that politics is coming here, and that's very, very bad for this region, which is very, very bad for this province, and to the extent that that wedge is being uh, hammered all across this country, it's very, very bad for this country. Because Edmonton is, um, is a center of a metropolitan system that runs from Fort St. John to Yellowknife to Churchill. Uh, and yes, down to Calgary, and it's part of an inextricable economic system with Calgary, and this other than, uh, the hockey stuff, like we really need to think about the three million Albertans who are part of, um, economically speaking, a larger um, economic footprint than the lower mainland of BC. And yet we allow ourselves to be divided, urban and rural, city to city, and now is really the time to pull together. And so, but even just in a regional context, and I was thinking about this the other day, even just, and, and I know for some of you it will feel like, how, why haven't we dealt with urban sprawl yet? Right? And I get that question a lot, because I came to City Hall to try to deal with urban sprawl. And I promise you, we're dealing with it. I'm going to get to it in the context of the city plan. But, but I was remembering a meeting. I was talking about this with Peter Ohm earlier today, where this map got spread out on the table um, in Mayor Mandel's office. And I was in on this regional strategy session. We were looking at how big is the city going to get? How much land are we going to need? How many annexations are we going to need to do in all the different directions if we continue to grow the way we've been growing for the last generation? And they rolled out this map, and the city went from, you know, north of the, the CFB Edmonton, out past Enoch, and south of the airport. And I looked at this, and I went... <laughs> I had, a, I had a physical reaction to this map. I said, that is not what I came here to do. And then here we are, 10 years later, on the second iteration of our regional growth plan with density targets that are way up, infill expectations that are way up. And what does that all mean? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna consume much less land. In fact, 250 quarter sections of land will be spared from low density expansion, not just of Edmonton, but of the communities around us. And we've all agreed that we're gonna raise the, the minimum stakes for density. And what does that translate to? Five billion dollars worth of infrastructure savings. Roads, pipes, 
fire stations, sidewalks, recreation centers. So there's some efficiency. And you can kind of just imagine that by saying, okay, if you don't have pavement going out past the airport and out past Enoch in all directions, there's going to be some efficiencies there. And so the city plan really asks of Edmontonians, what, is, what do we want to expect of ourselves, not just from that floor, but above that? And so I can report to you now that notwithstanding that our annexation was, was controversial when we took land down to Highway 19, the first draft of the annexation took way more land, basically all the way around Beaumont, and basically all, you know, down the back side of the airport, and so we shrank that annexation a lot, and as we kept raising the density targets, we went from saying, well, that's 30 years of land, to now that's 50 years worth of land. And now with the city plan, we're saying, okay, with the lines on the map that are there today, we think we can stick within that. So it's not, strictly speaking, a growth boundary, but it is an expectation for us to um, build communities for those next million people within the, ex the existing boundaries of the city. And um, that's critically important for a whole bunch of environmental, public health, and fiscal reasons. Um, so about half of that growth, and I'll maybe back up and tell you a story about the last municipal development plan. Um, I was, I think, 29 or 30 and didn't know what I was talking about. And so I audaciously suggested, well, maybe we should see if we can get at least 25% of our new growth over the next um, life of this municipal development plan within the f existing, not just boundaries, but footprint of the city using infill and, and building up with transit-oriented development and density. And I, well, I actually started at 50, and I got pretty much laughed out of council chambers and told that would be impossible. And so I got talked down to or amended down to 25, and, and it was still characterized as a stretch goal. Well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll shoot for that, but, you know, I don't want to raise anybody's expectations here. Well, I can tell you last year, 25% of the new units in the city, 10 years later, were accommodated within the existing built footprint of the city. Um, and that's how long it takes to turn a ship this big. You can't just shut off the supply of new housing on the edge of town and expect there to even be economic capacity, uh, regulatory framework financing regimes, all the things that markets need to start to build towers and purpose-built rental and more skinny homes and better brownstones and all the different things. It takes a long time to create that regulatory space and for the market to inhabit it. But that's happening now. That gives us, in this new city plan, the opportunity, without anybody getting laughed out of the room at all, to say, let's go for 50. And for the other 50% that's going to go on the farmer's fields between here and the airport that we annexed, we're going to deliver that at a level of density where transit's going to make sense, where you're going to be able to walk to things, and where the roads and the pipes and the sidewalks will actually be ec economically sustainable for the taxpayer. And so I'll, I'll maybe close by putting this in a, in a, in a specific context. I, I was uh, last... Friday, I was on the radio with Mayor Nenshi. Every once in a while, we get on the Alberta at Noon show on CBC. And a fellow phoned in and um, asked a question that I get asked a lot in a lot of different ways. And, and I, I get sucked in every time to however someone asks the question, because I like to actually answer the question. I know it's novel. I'm not a politician. I only play one on TV. <laughs> and so, so the guy, the, the question was very specifically, um, my taxes have doubled over the last 15 years, and I want to know what's your plan to bring them down over the next five. And I hooked on to bring them down over the next five and said, uh, I don't have a plan to bring them down over the next five. I'm working really hard with my council colleagues to bend the rate of those tax increases down closer to inflation because we understand the, the pressure that people are facing. And if you look at all the data, the city's done this over the last five years. We've really moderated our appetite. But we don't want to fall behind by having the, the, the sort of current value of the revenue of the city of Edmonton erode against inflation at the same time. That's part of how we fell behind in the 90s. And then I went into the, all the history of, you know, what, in my estimation, what drove the more or less doubling of taxes over 15 years. And because it bears repeating, because even in the last couple of budget debates, you now have people coming to city council who lack this context. 
We now have, frankly, some voices in the provincial government who lack this context and are critical of the fiscal decisions of your local democracy, which you elected, and I report to you, not to them. But, and you can ask me about that, because I get a little hot on your collar. But, <laughs> but say so three things drove that, that massive increase in the cost of delivering services and infrastructure to the people of Edmonton over the last 15 years. Say so boom time inflation. Like you all remember, our houses doubled in price. Uh, labor doubled in price. Everything got more expensive, and the city of Edmonton buys in that same marketplace. So there was massive inflation and crowding out in those boom times that, that we couldn't hide from. We were actually overexposed to it because of the lines of business that we're in. So much construction and so much labor-intensive frontline work that we do. Second was fixing the city up after the last period of austerity. So having run the city down in the 90s by uh, stopping investing, uh, you know, we didn't build a rec center here for 25 years. Um, and we did silly things like lay off the people who patched the cracks in the roads. And we all know what happened 10 years later, right? And then when, when the drought was over and, the, and, and the, the soil all got wet, all of a sudden, like, it was a political crisis. We had a pothole crisis, right? Well, that didn't just happen. That happened because of neglect of our public assets. The $13 billion worth of roads that previous generations paid for and built and stewarded and tended, our city council of the day stopped doing that. And it cost us, we went from spending $20 million a year ballpark on road maintenance to 200 in the time that, I, that, that Ben and I have been there. Um, and that's just to catch up. And we're still not fully caught up. So digging our way out of austerity was the second thing that drove those tax increases. So if you take a 25-year average, it, it's actually normalized because we didn't raise taxes and then the city fell apart and then we raised taxes during a boom time. And the third thing, though, was 300,000 extra people showing up <laughs> over the course of those 15 years. 37% population increase. We went from 700,000 to basically a million sometime this year all needing roads and pipes and sidewalks, and we decided to build four great rec centers, and we decided to catch up, and so the costs went up. So when my answer to this guy should have been, and it's not a five-year thing, it's a 50-year thing, but the way that this place is going to be economically sustainable for taxpayers and ratepayers, and by the way, fun to live, and by the way, healthy, and by the way, lower carbon footprint, is by building that more compact city. That's why the city plan is so important. It will mean lower taxes in the future. And I'll just give you one last comparator, which is um, I was born in St. Albert, so I, I can't say born and raised in Edmonton. I was uh, born and raised in the Edmonton metropolitan region, I can say. <laughs> um, and so I love St. Albert, and Mayor Heron's a good friend of mine, and she's heard me say this before, so, so she'll forgive me. But, you know, taxes are higher in St. Albert. Do you know why? because there's no high density residential and not very much industrial tax base to offset the real cost of providing services to a predominantly residential, predominantly low density community. That's the actual cost of doing business for uh, 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 a community the shape of St. Albert. And Edmonton is basically sort of eight more St. Alberts around a downtown and a couple of industrial parks. And so we cannot afford to build, and neither can St. Albert, and they're building towers, and they're doing the same thing, and they're bought into the metro mindset and sustainable growth. So none of us can afford to build that way anymore. But I actually think that the neighborhoods that we're starting to see now, where you can actually, and I remember knocking on doors 12 years ago, what do you want in your neighborhood? I just wish I could walk somewhere and get a cup of coffee and meet my neighbors. We're building those neighborhoods now, and that's why it's going to be cool to live here for the next million people. Mayor Don Iveson. <laughs> and by the way, way under what the prognosticators had for the time of there your was an over -under opening on remarks. There was an over-under, and if you bet on the under, you just did all right. I abandoned uh, page four of my notes. I yeah. got a whole thing. So. <laughs> well, we'll get back to a lot of that. Uh, appreciate you teeing up this conversation. Kaylin? I'm going to take it off. Right. Over to you. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, it was an honor to be asked to join this panel, and I'm really excited to share some thoughts on what it means to build a city for two million people. So as a 21-year-old uh, with strong roots in the city, I'm really proud to call Edmonton home. 
I've lived in three different houses and a garage suite in the same neighborhood, and I've explored this city from Hende to Hende and beyond. I love the festivals, the river, the people, and the spirit of community that we have here. However, I, along with most of my friends in their early 20s, am currently deciding whether to stay. Is this the city that I want to build a career in? A family? A life? I'm hoping the city plan will help answer some of those questions. So to start off here today, I'd like to give some thoughts on the best way to accomplish three of the main things that the city plan needs to do. Keep young people in Edmonton, attract new young people to Edmonton, and create community among us all. So first of all, to retain young people in Edmonton, we need climate resilience to be interwoven into everything that we do. Young people all over the world are asking for cities where climate action is a foundation of the way that we grow, live, and get around. We can't become a truly sustainable city by simply taking surface level actions like planting a few trees or banning plastic bags. Of course, those things are a good place to start, but ongoing stewardship of this place really requires changes that allow all Edmontonians to live and move in ways that reduce our environmental impact. So when talking to other young people about the best way to make this happen, better transit is consistently at the top of the list. So that means the frequency and reliability that we expect from a world-class city. It means permanent LRT infrastructure that supports that high-density development that we need. And it means accessible <laughs> and connected to other active, multimodal uh, ways of getting around. So better transit is only one of many ways to make this city more sustainable. But the main takeaway is this. To show young people that this is a city they should stay in, Edmonton needs to be a leader in effective, innovative actions for climate resilience. So in the spirit of innovation, I come to the second big idea, which is key to attracting uh, new young people to Edmonton. We really need to be known as a young city where ideas are created and can come to life. Attracting industries and research labs uh, focused on innovative sectors like artificial intelligence and energy transitions will help us get there, as well as supporting those community-based initiatives and startups. We really need to embrace new ideas, uh, create partnerships throughout the city, and have an identity that's more than just Alberta's capital city. I think that we want young people from around the world who are looking for a forward-thinking and opportunity-rich city to think of Edmonton first. So let's say that uh, at 2 million people, we have a diverse city of uh, 2 million who have called Edmonton home. How do we connect with each other? How do we ensure that we all belong and thrive in our communities? I think the key to building those connections is the ability to live locally. So that means like the little things that turn your neighborhood into a community. Being able to walk your kids to school, knowing the owner of the bakery down the street, having affordable food options nearby, and celebrating with outdoor festivals year-round. It also means design focused on safety, so the kind of outdoor lighting and open public spaces that make everyone, particularly women and gender minorities, feel comfortable. And it means continually improving how we welcome uh, diverse Edmontonians into this city, having multi-generational and multicultural public spaces where we can all connect with each other, tackling homelessness through housing first policies and action, and fostering inclusiveness of LGBTQ2 plus communities and new Canadians. Now, I'd like to end by saying that as a foundation of city plan and other processes of planning and development, we need to question and deconstruct our relationship with the land as settlers in Treaty 6 territory. Planning is inherently driven by colonial approaches to taking land, dividing it up, and prescribing what we do with it. And as such, we need to go beyond simply acknowledging the history of the land and truly endeavor to understand its significance to the people who have been here since time immemorial. We need to learn and share the truth about how we came to have a city of one million here so that we can strive for reconciliation as we plan for another million. Now, I do not claim to have the exact solutions to make this happen, um, and I still have a lot to learn about the treaty relationship. But it has to start with those conversations, the collaboration, and seeking to understand Indigenous knowledge about this place. So overall, the city plan offers a landmark opportunity to start these conversations and build an inclusive urban place we are all proud to call home. For me, the decision to stay in Edmonton relies on having opportunities to work in a globally connected and innovative economy, while also being able to raise a family in a sustainable and connected local community. 
really looking forward to the discussions here today. And I'd just like to challenge you to think about how you can bring these conversations about the future of Edmonton back to the communities that you call home. Thank you very much. Incredible. Thanks very much, Kaylin. Robin, over to you. Wow, now I have to follow all of this up. <laughs> well, you got it. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Robin Taylor. It's a really, it's an absolute honor to be here on this panel, and I'm really looking forward to the discussions that we're having today. So to introduce myself, I'm Robin, as I said. I'm currently the Social Equity Chair on the City of Edmonton Youth Council and the Program Coordinator of a collective named Why You the Come Up, and I'm also an econ and bio student at the university. Uh, to go back even further, I moved to Edmonton when I was nine from an island of Jamaica. The island of Jamaica, you may know of that island. And um, I felt very welcome here, if I'm being honest. You know, welcome from, welcomed by my new teachers, my new friends, my new community members and leaders. And I really accredit Edmonton to being one of those places that caused me to believe in myself and my capabilities. And I saw it as a place that encouraged others to unlock their potential as well. So as I grew up, I got more involved in volunteering and community work, and I started to see my vision of Edmonton change. That understanding that I had, um, I realized that it wasn't offered to all residents of this city in the same capacity, and that really bothered me. And that's kind of why I got involved in this kind of work. Um, I still like Edmonton, <laughs> don't worry. And I really appreciate that the city plan has taken a very holistic view um, regarding how we're gonna be preparing this city for two million people. Uh, to me, a city should be a place of positivity where people from all backgrounds, ages, genders, um, stories can come together and create a positive impact on themselves, their loved ones, and their community. And so I really appreciate a plan that takes a very people first lens when it comes to developing how we want to move in this city. Uh, because, you know, as big as West Edmonton Mall is, <laughs> it's not the buildings that cause me to appreciate Edmonton, it's the people, right? So I admire a framework that really um, uses these issues and the realities that we face in our day to day life to shape how we want to move um, in the city in the future. With you know, speaking of the future, we're definitely facing very complex issues and that requires very complex solutions. And it also requires a city that invests in creativity and innovation in order to address these problems. Investments in human capital, entrepreneurship and community are then paramount to creating a successful future city. With the onslaught of the climate emergency, our relationship with the land and redefining it and reconstructing it is essential and then our relationship with indigenous peoples and communities then should become a main priority. Um, I think my favorite part about the city plan is, is the district's idea actually, where neighborhoods have access to basic services and activities that they need to, se to serve their daily needs, right? I'm looking forward to possibly getting raspberries from local markets and um, having my workplace be within 15 minutes walk of my house, of my home. Uh, what I'd also like to see is ease of access to mental health services and health services in general and transit that connects me to every part of the city easily. Easily? <laughs> Working on it. Easily. <laughs> I put times three on my cue card. I could go on and on about the city that I'd like to see and the future and the city plan, but we have a discussion and a mirror for that. So I'd just like to close by saying that I'm really excited by this proposed plan, if I'm being honest. And I really encourage everyone to start talking about how Edmonton can be a better city for you and for your communities. I talked to a variety of youth, a variety of communities, and we got so many diverse answers that were really exciting, you know, and it's really an important topic that we should all have our voices heard on. So, um, let me get to my last cue card. <laughs> I'm really excited that this, for this plan, as I said, and I'm hoping that it can create a better, more equitable community. I'm also very interested in seeing the actual implementation of these ideas and learning more about the city's plan. So thank you so much for having me here and I'm looking forward to these discussions.
Beautifully done, Robin. Thank you very much. Uh, and I've written down about 60 questions from what the three of you have put in front of us. But uh, my job right now is to get to your questions, uh, the ones that you submitted. Keep in mind that, uh, as the mayor has reminded us, with the 37% population growth, I think you said it was over 15 years, uh, Edmonton closed in on and, and is right around that million uh, resident mark. But here tonight, we're talking about attracting and retaining one million more. And uh, there's been a lot of talk in the province in the last little while. Uh, I think one of the realities, and, and as a talk show host, I think I'm, I'm privy to these discussions, uh, most especially uh, some of the realities around budget cuts, program funding, and uh, one of the very real conversations that we've been having is around the innovation that happens, the research that happens at our universities. Uh, and I'd be curious to know, and, and I want to ask this to, to all three of you, but I want to go our, to our young panelists first. Uh, because you're, this is your reality right now. And like you told us, Kaylin, you have an important decision to make. And of course, Robin, uh, obviously you will make that important decision as well, where you would like to launch your career, where you believe you have the best chance to succeed. How can we attract students from all over the world to study in Edmonton and ultimately to keep their talents in Edmonton and to continue to contribute to and build Edmonton rather than another major Canadian city? a fantastic question. Do you want to yeah. take it first? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that you find that it kind of goes beyond the quality of education sometimes, especially living in a globalized world. Um, we're very lucky to have many, you know, accredited educational you know, post-secondary institutions that people can go to. So it's really about the quality of city and the quali quality of the city and the quality of life. And I feel as if looking at different sectors like the recreational activities that are available for students, how connected are we as a community? How do the youth even feel in this city? Is it somewhere that I could feel comfortable with and build a home in? Are all really important questions and factors that we need to take into consideration, as well as the support system. Like talking to someone from King's University, she mentioned that the reason that a lot of international students go there is because she, they feel really supported. There's a system in place that helps them to maneuver, you know, the complex reality of like moving to a whole new country and being, you know, implemented into a whole new system. Um, so I think that those are all things that we need to take into consideration and looking at how um, Edmonton is faring in terms of global issues as well with this move in like climate, climate sustainability and more creativity and innovation, how is Edmonton faring? Um, with those larger topics and what is the opportunity and economic opportunity like in the city. So I do think it moves beyond um, the academic um, sector and really focuses also on the city life as well. Uh, and then part of that I think um, comes down to Edmonton's reputation. Uh, a lot of the students I talk to at the U of A see Edmonton as a stepping stone going to a bigger city like Vancouver or Toronto mm -hmm. where they think that they have more economic opportunities especially in the different kinds of industries that uh, young people are getting into today, whether it's you know, more of that innovation and research. Um, a lot of people see Edmonton as really a place to go if you want to get into oil and gas, um, but they don't see a lot of other prospects here. Uh, I have a lot of friends from high school who have gone to Toronto, Montreal, uh, looking for uh, opportunities in arts and performance theater, uh, economics, different uh, things like that. I um, heard some stats recently as well that the youth labor force in Alberta is increasing right now. We have a lot of young people in this province, but the employment levels are just steady. Um, and youth unemployment in Alberta is really high right now because it doesn't seem like the jobs that we have are matching the skills that our young people have. Um, so we really need to work on matching those two things up to have people wanting to stay here and then knowing that it's a place they should come to. Mayor, let me tweak the question for you. Uh, you know, how do we attract students from all over the world to study in Edmonton as opposed to other major Canadian cities? But then, how do we also keep our university grads successfully employed here, not pulled away to other cities like Kaylin and Robin have described? Well, we actually, we actually do really well here uh, with attracting students um, internationally. So we have, at any given time, um, thousands, and the numbers vary, but, but uh, the U of A tracks this and has the largest number of, of Chinese international students of any Canadian university, and I think it's well over 4,000 um, at last count. And so 
Um, and, and interestingly, and I wouldn't have necessarily thought this, but when we were in Beijing meeting with the alumni chapter there of the U of A, and I, I spoke, and, and I, it was really heartwarming to hear people who uh, were Chinese nationals and back there and doing business, and the fondness they have for this place and the positivity of their experience, the, the warmth of the welcome that they had, and the business ties that they maintained. So it's, it's not just about can we get the people to stay here, it's can we have create a positive impression, create networks that can open up trade opportunities for us. Because one of our big problems, why we have struggle with business growth here, is that we're not sufficiently export-minded. So achieving an export mindset, whether you're uh, an oil and gas parts manufacturer or um, a food value added uh, or a service company, whatever it is that you do, um, involves being connected to the world. And, and so I think international students, and some people say, oh, well, we shouldn't make space for international students in our schools. They're crowding out domestic students. I, I think that's a false trade-off. You need both. Um, but, but the stat that blew me away is that uh, a after a couple of years, I think it's only 20 or 30 percent of uh, those uh, particularly Chinese students choose to stay here. But after five years, half of them have gone back to China you know, um, worked for a while, done whatever they needed to do there, and then it ended up coming back. So the long-term retention was actually way higher than I would have thought it would have been. And um, people are global citizens. They're connected all over the place. So it's not always just about attracting. It's also about connecting. And I think international students in post-secondary are, are really critical to that from a trade point of view. But I, I, what really resonated with me about um, the, uh, Robin and Kalen's answer to this question is really brand or, or reputation or sense of place and welcome. And we've been trying to do more to welcome uh, new students who come from other places, uh, formally with the city being involved with a welcoming event and, and making people feel welcome here uh, so that they have that positive experience and more will choose to stay here. But I think the root of your earlier question is something I'm thinking about a lot is our capacity to generate um, not just talent, I think we generate great talent. We have, and I'll stand up for them, uh, some of the best public schools in the world here. They're, um, I'm, I'm concerned about what's gonna happen to our public schools. But that is, that is, that was honestly, I mean, when Sarah and I were deciding, because it was almost the same thing, I was like, well, maybe we're gonna wind up in Toronto or Vancouver and uh, kind of passing back through Edmonton, it was the quality of public education for, for our family, the affordability of housing, and a sense of friendliness in the community and economic opportunity and a sense of sort of entrepreneurial possibility. All those things were what attracted us here. All that's still here. The entrepreneurial pieces seeming a little bit tougher to navigate these days because of some of the economic realities. But when I, when I meet, um, I mean, they're, just to give you one in sector example, there are oil and gas manufacturers who are screaming right now and there are oil and gas manufacturers who are turning into health device advanced manufacturing companies. And they're not screaming, they're developing global markets and they're keeping their people at work um, and they're expanding. Um, and so I think, I hear that pain, but anger is not usually a good place to make long-term business decisions from. So if, if part of what we need is, you know, a variety of different ways to help uh, entrepreneurs adapt their businesses and the capacity that's been built here, um, then we need to look at all of that as, as our part of our, not just our talent development and employment um, uh, conversation, but also, uh, you know, helping, helping our industries retool and stay relevant. But, but we do more than oil and gas here. I mean, that's a huge part of our economy and it is, it is changing dramatically. But um, we produce food here, we're a healthcare hub for Northern Canada and building off that and our competence around machine learning and big data. And because there's a whole bunch of specific things that happen to happen only in Edmonton, we are emerging as a real leader around health and big data. And, and the sky's the limit for that. And that's uh, sort of recession proof to the price of oil. So we are more diversified than the last time we got hit and the last time before that. We're not where we need to be yet. Um, but I think solving some of those, those climate challenges, those green building challenges, like I, I always say, you know, we're not oil and gas, we're energy. And I want to make sure we're relevant to the energy systems of the world um, long after combustion is, is done as the place where we get energy. So I, I think we have to be ambitious, we have to be audacious about it. Um, but there's a big transition happening and we can be angry about it, 
or we can get with the program, really. Uh, a key target within the city plan is that 50% of trips are made by transit and active transportation. Uh, a certain part of that would be changing people's habits. Uh, I think changing people's mindsets that Edmonton is a car city. But I wonder if it might be less of a task to change minds with the younger generation, the Edmontonians that will lead this city into the next 30 or 40 or 50 years. What do you hear, what do you see from your peers when mm -hmm. it comes to how they choose to move around a city? Yeah, um, I think I'll jump off of something Robin was talking about earlier, how um, the thing you need out of your transit system is for it to be easy. Like, we need our transit system and active transportation modes to be the most cost effective, uh, the fastest, and the most convenient ways to get places. It's not about having big public information campaigns to convince people, you need to leave your car, get rid of your car, go do other modes of transportation. It's really about building a city in which a vehicle is not necessarily the easiest way to get places. Um, something City Council was looking at last week, getting rid of parking minimums, is one huge step uh, to start building a city that doesn't rely on personal vehicles as the main way of getting around. And then really investing in alternative transportation. Um, like Ryan said, I started winter biking this year, and that's really made me appreciate uh, our city during the winter time, not want to just flee because it's too cold and I can't live here. Um, having the infrastructure though, like the downtown bike grid, was the one thing that allowed me to do that. Having safe ways to move around our city, um, having different modes of transportation that connect with each other and make it the easiest, cheapest, and most convenient way to get anywhere that you need to be. Robin? Yeah, I agree. I definitely, as I said, think that transit needs to be a lot easier. If you're asking me about my friends and their experiences with transit, it's very um, mixed, you know? <laughs> um, I definitely think that it's important for us to have a transit system that's reliable, but also consistent and also far reaching and co you know constant, right? Um, so I know a lot of people that have struggles with you know, bus networks ending at 5 p.m. or running every hour or trains not coming on time, right? So I think that there's a lot of different things that probably could be fixed <laughs> and addressed. But I also do think that we do need to reimagine and um, rethink our connection with the land and with nature, right? Because I don't think that right now, especially the issue with urban cities, is that we always become more and more distant from nature and with and with our land and where we get all of our resources from, right? I was, when I was preparing for this panel, I had looked in my backyard for probably the first time in five years, which is already a bad thing, and I saw all of the snow there. And you know, for the first time in probably 10 years, I was like, wow, that would actually be really fun to play in or really fun to walk in. I know, why would I think that? Probably because it was five degrees. <laughs> it was a minus 50. <laughs> but I do think that we are becoming a lot more distant when it comes to our connection with nature. And because of that, it makes it harder for us to go and walk down to the market or you know, take the bus and enjoy the scenery, right? So I do think that having efficient and consistent transit is important but also going back to our connection with nature and with the land and why and how it's supported us you know, for all these years and going back to that is also really important as well. So Mayor, we'll talk about how you know, the transit service needs to change as we prepare to grow and ultimately grow to two million residents. Uh, and we'll wonder what this means uh, through your eyes for Edmontonians on a day-to-day -day basis. I'd like to tee this up uh, in the context of expending political capital and exhibiting political will. Take us into this. <laughs> I have, I have uh, well, it's easy, it's easy for me because I've always run on needing to do certain things with our transit system. Four elections back and uh, Councillor Knack was at an event where we were doing some things with our neighbours because we're just about ready to launch a regional transit commission to bring these nine different systems together so that you can move seamlessly across metro, not just across the city. And uh, um, I was reflecting on the speech I gave um, on election night in 2007 and I was very excited. <laughs> And the reporter was like, what's the first thing you're going to do? And I'd be like, I'm going to fix the transit system. <laughs> I'm gonna, and, and they're like, how are you going to do it? I said, well, I'm going to go find all the other city councillors who think it needs to be fixed, and we're going to fix it. And 12 years later, it's almost fixed. <laughs> 
so things don't move that quickly. But um, uh, but what I was reflecting on is that these things that, that I've been working on and many other people have been working on for a really long time to try to get a transit system that will perform the way we've heard um, all riders, but particularly people were making the decision, like, am I going to have to buy a car? Can I actually live, a, maybe not car-free, but car-light lifestyle here, um, you know, through car sharing or, you know, relying on different kinds of ride sharing or being able to borrow a car from a friend from time to time when you need, but not need one every day of your life. And the quality of public transit and cycling and walking infrastructure and a suite of alternatives that fill in all the gaps for people is what's necessary to do that. It's one of the reasons why, why we were the first city to, uh, to approve rules for companies like Uber to be able to operate was so that there would be more choices because more choices was going to help. But fundamentally, I mean, the, the, the transit system is one of these backbone pieces. And it can either be the thing that you use if you have no choice or it can be attractive to use such that you would choose it over all of the other modes, including driving. And we have not had that bus system um, since, well, certainly the 60s um, and maybe even before when in the streetcar days. Um, but we, uh, the, the system deteriorated and deteriorated and deteriorated. And now we continue to pour money into it and expand it to all corners of the city. But in my estimation, we were running a very circuitous um, system trying to get to everybody and then have all the buses come to a transfer point so that you could switch to any other route which if you have no choice is better than nothing but are you gonna take a 45 minute bus ride that's off the beaten path so that you can connect with another 45 minute bus to get to where you're going only if you have no choice are you gonna do that and so we needed to not just lay lots of LRT. I mean, I, uh, we're going to double the amount of uh, track in the city um, from when I started to what we've authorized when we finished the West LRT procurement. And that's huge. That's the sort of back backbone. But you've got to actually bend the whole bus system to feed into that so that you can, at right angles or you know, efficiently get quickly from activity node to activity node such that people would want to use this as their primary means of transportation. And I'm, I think we're going to get a step change improvement in satisfaction and utility for the investment that we're putting in today. And, and so we had to go through bus network redesign to do this and we, have, we all have the scars to prove uh, uh, that, that it was a really tough conversation because the people who have that bus that goes right by their house today and do choose it for whatever reason um, feel very attached to that service as they know it. But the issue is we cannot scale that up for another million people cost effectively. It's already starting to break down. So we had to re-engineer it entirely and the new system is going to provide much better service. At some point you're going to be able to tap and get on it with your <laughs> smartphone or your... I know it's a long story why it's taken so long. But w let me just uh, put, put it this way. We're going to make sure it works before we turn it on. We're not going to have another <laughs> transit IT kerfuffle. So we're taking our time to get it right and, and have a little bit of sympathy for the fact that notwithstanding we may form a regional transit commission with our neighbors, we had to build a system with nine different partners. That made it much more complicated as well and to make sure it's going to work on day one. So we're getting there on transit. I want to talk about climate resilience. Uh, both uh, uh, Kaylin and Robin have, have touched on that, uh, the idea of reconciliation. Robin, several times you've mentioned our relationship to the land. Uh, the city plan proposes smarter and more purposeful growth to achieve our local carbon budget of 135 megatons by preventing further urban sprawl and encouraging redevelopment. I want to encourage you to be creative or take this question wherever you like. What ways can we as a community protect our water, air, and land for future generations, and please feel free to infuse uh, your interpretation of what meaningful reconciliation or revisiting the idea of how we've built this city, how that would play into it. Robin, considering your role in the Youth Council, I'd like to start with you. Okay, sure. Um, also, going back to transit, once just, um, just for a second, <laughs> on how to make it more appealing notes. to youth, I feel as if it definitely needs to be more affordable and accessible. And also dynamic to like our regular city lives, you know, especially we're living in a winter city with minus 30 weather. Um, one of the members on the social equity subcommittee, Yanni, she's proposing a policy where we have like an extension onto the extreme regular transit um, 
system where when it's below minus 30 weather, there shouldn't really be a cost to transit, right? Because people are just trying to go out and, you know, go to work, go to school, that kind of thing. So I think making it more affordable and also reimagining how we're using the transit system and seeing it as a tool for us to get to places rather than a barrier is also really important. I think that there's actually a lot of barriers in the city that need to be dismantled for us to move forward. And then moving into your city, um, to your question. Of, Let me interrupt um, you for a second before we move on. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you, you, and, and I wonder if when you discuss some of the barriers in this city, they need to be addressed and eliminated. Do you have a couple top of mind right now that you can think of? Okay. Um, Did I just ask you a two hour question? <laughs> I'm trying to condense it, you know, and also think on my feet. Um, Actually, recently, in a class that I've taken, where Bashir Mohammed, a lot of people might know about him, he did a really amazing presentation on the history of Edmonton and where racism and discrimination came from. Sorry, it's going to get a little bit, <laughs> it's going to go there. That's why we're here. But I was really surprised to see just how many people didn't know about the history of Edmonton and just the, the infrastructure that we've had that, as Kaylin said, is very colonial. For example, Borden Park the pool was segregated, right? And no one knew about that. And I think that a really big barrier that we have in the city is just not knowing our history. And when we don't know our history, it causes us to really negate and belittle the experiences of you know, marginalized communities and minorities. And because of that, not giving credence to those um, opinions and those experiences, it causes us not to really address the issues that are within the city. So I would say that a huge barrier is just ignorance and not knowing and having those conversations and constructive conversations about you know, those social issues within our city. Hopefully that answers some That's of your wonderful. question. That's wonderful, thank you. But yeah, to go back. <laughs> Thanks. I'm actually very nervous, so your, your applause really helps. <laughs> Um, to go back to your question on, you know, the environment and things, I find that our city, as Mayor Iverson and Kaylin said, we're actually very innovative already. You know, there are a lot of social enterprises and activism movements and just, you know, sustainably focused businesses that are proposing solutions to these climate solutions. For example, Hemp Pact, which is this university-run, um, no, started organization that's trying to make um, eco-friendly feminine hygiene products, right? There are a lot of ideas here on how to address these issues for the environment, but another barrier is access to capital, you know, and access to actually testing these ideas out and doing those trials and coming back and doing research. That's not here yet, and it's not accessible. Even if it's here, it's not accessible to the youth or the university student who has this idea at five in the morning and doesn't know where to go, you know? So I do think that one way that we can address and make and, you know, I feel like I'm forgetting the question, but <laughs> one way that we can, you know, build on how we can become more climate resilient is trying to create those opportunities for youth and not even youth, just people who have these ideas to test them out and actually get them out in the community. And also how we um, manage our waste, I think really needs to be addressed. You know, I don't know if I necessarily saw <laughs> When I looked at the city plan, I don't know if I saw like necessarily a direct plan to how we are addressing our waste management systems and the fact that the organic facility is closed down and you know we need to know we need to have these things and those infrastructures here right so how we come up with a climate solution moving into the future is really important but also how we manage the things that we put behind and our waste and all of those things is also really important for us to um, look at too yeah, yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll hop right on that um, organic waste and food systems. I think that's a really important part about becoming a climate resilient city. It's turning our food systems... In one of my second year planning classes, we learned about how cities are like feedlots, where we get our food from somewhere else, bring it into the city, have restaurants, you know, our home kitchens, and then our waste goes out somewhere that we don't see it. And that's the kind of actions that we can take in a city that really have a detrimental impact uh, on our environment, but that we aren't conscious of because it's easy to just push it aside and not pay attention. Uh, but where our food comes from and where our waste goes are really crucial to making those kind of changes. So, um, for example, celebrating the uh, 
great agricultural land that we have in this region and promoting uh, new types of urban agriculture as well, having uh, urban agriculture within our city, making it easier to have community gardens and uh, different types of food systems, allowing for uh, different agricultural producers within the region to transition towards more plant-based um, products that can be consumed right here in Edmonton. And then when it comes to waste, um, working on our organics processing and our recycling and landfills, there's so many different actions we can take. Um, but to start out uh, this morning in one of my classes, we were talking about how Sweden is such a fantastic uh, model of waste management because they deal with 99% of their waste is diverted from landfills. And in Edmonton right now, I believe we're at about 45% being diverted and that is not acceptable. Um, there are so many different things we can do to innovate and uh, treat our waste as um, products that need to be returned back through composting if they're uh, able to be composted, recycled, uh, waste to energy kind of production. And one thing that we need to do to make that happen is uh, foster regional collaboration surrounding waste management, because uh, I don't think we're doing a good enough job of that right now. Mayor. Uh, so who thinks it's time to hand the keys to the Youth Council to run the city? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and I, I mean that in all seriousness, because they have the right questions and a whole bunch of the answers uh, clearer than we're thinking about them uh, in, in many cases. Uh, I think the way I want to maybe tie this together a little bit, because um, I agree with everything that's been said, is uh, uh, it's not in the city plan because the waste utility is sort of arm's length and we treat it separately so it has its own strategy. But last year we approved, and I think we've got quorum of the utility committee, so if we need to update the strategy, we can. But, um, but, but we now have a goal to get to 90, and it was again one of these things people say, oh, you can never get to 90, you can never get to 90. Well, other places are tracking that way, and we were tracking that way until we hit some snags with technology, and um, it's a long story, but, but we want to get to 90 as well. Um, but that's processing what comes to the Waste Management Center. And as important as that is, I think there's an even deeper conversation behind that, that and I'm going to try really hard to tie all this back together, even to reconciliation, uh, which is that um, there is a whole chain of events that lead to there being that much garbage in the first place that has to do with our consumption patterns and our lifestyle and our culture. And um, even in terms of climate change, um, we measured the emissions at the point of sort of final use. And so the emissions profile for Edmonton is everything that we're burning here, essentially. And, you know, we're counting the, the emissions from our power plants up the, up the power line. Um, but it's really end use. And that's sort of half the battle, but it's only counting energy. And there's a big push right now, and we're part of a lot of global networks that see this from a global systems point of view, you know, networks of thousands of cities who are working on these issues at a systemic level. Um, and we've been pushing something, and there was the Edmonton Declaration about a year and a half ago when the IPCC was here. And the thing they were pushing out of that that was really new and scary to a lot of people, something called consumption-based accounting around carbon. And, and for Alberta, this would actually be a really good thing in one respect, which is, and the, the uh, oil and gas folks talk about this as wells to wheels, which is where do you attribute the emissions? Okay, so there's a footprint, if you're an energy producer, to producing the resource. But if you're doing that because there's a market somewhere for it where the end user is paying for it and combusting it and getting the benefit of the, the use of the energy, then where is the attribution of the... Um, from the point of demand at the end use, where is their attribution of the footprint from the production? You know, in other words, when people in BC lecture people in Alberta about our carbon footprint and then get upset when we th threaten to turn off the taps, there's a disconnect between the producer and the end user. And likewise, when Canadians give China a hard time about their smokestacks, the smokestacks are there because of the stuff we're buying, not just Canadians, but all around the world. But cumulatively, and our, our waste footprint is a trailing indicator of this. We produce more garbage here than in most other places in the world as Canadians. We're just um, unbelievably wasteful consumers. 
in terms of packaging, in terms of food waste, all these other things. So our entire lifestyle is creating this footprint and we're blaming other people for the production footprint associated with the stuff that we're buying from elsewhere in the world. And that's just a complete breakdown of systems thinking. And that's the problem with reconciliation, that's the problem with hatred and division, that's the problem with respect for, for all life forms, whether they're human or otherwise. Like, there is, there is a system here called life. And I've been doing a lot of yoga lately, so <laughs> bear with me here. And not just because of what Peter McKay said. I was doing it before it was politically controversial to do yoga, but... But no, like, I mean, we, we, have, we have developed pods in which we travel and houses in which we live and communities that some people want to put gates around and countries that we want to put fences around and said so there's an us and a them. When there is one extended living system of, of, of soil and air and water and we're just a part of it and we pass through it and we treat it like it's a dumping ground. And now that's a broader human problem. But I do think Edmontonians in their heart of hearts, when we set up our compost bins and when we try to figure out how I can use this bus system that doesn't seem very friendly, and when I try to do the right thing, it's because we have an instinct. I think all humans do. We just get separated from it. But I think it's in communities like this where some of the ethical and cultural solutions that are going to be necessary to this that I think are going to come from a generation of leaders who just get this who just get it better than I do and better than the generation that came before me. But that's the kind of thinking that we need to have respectful relationships between all peoples, indigenous and settler, who are all, by the way, treaty people and who are all beneficiaries of the, of the arrangements that allow us to share this land as one. That's what we need more of. <clears throat> I'll be doing a meditation retreat next weekend. Uh, you invoking Peter McKay kind of, kind of nicely tees up a question that I'd like to ask you first as mayor of this city, and then two of our, our young civic leaders as well. Uh, this morning, tweeting in the third person, uh, the leadership hopeful for the Conservative Party of Canada said, when Peter McKay is prime minister, there will be no carbon tax. And uh, I, I would suggest that Mr. McKay uh, may suffer from uh, a shortened memory uh, and may benefit from being reminded is one of the key reasons, and this is John Baird that said it too, not just me, uh, one of the key reasons why the conservative message failed to resonate in Ontario and Quebec and British Columbia and among young voters. Uh, there are, uh, and I'll acknowledge, a real diversity uh, in age uh, as one of the demographics in this room, which is very encouraging, but I do think we acknowledge that trend-wise, there are different priorities uh, among generations and different opinions on the best ways to address environmental concerns and others. In other words, you'll find more support for uh, climate-aimed measures and, and, and methods like a carbon tax uh, among young people and, uh, than you will among older people. The fact of the matter is, and you acknowledge this, that Edmonton's $13 billion worth of infrastructure were built and paid for. That's just the roads. It's about just $46 the roads. billion dollars if you put is that right? the other So nearly $50 in, yeah. billion dollars in infrastructure were paid for by, including people in this room, generations of Edmontonians that, I don't want to say busted their asses because it's going to say ass up here, right? <laughs> it's just going to sit there. But they've worked very hard to build this city. They're invested in this city. They've raised their families in this city. They have done what we're endeavoring to have the next generation do, and that is study here and raise their families here and build this city. So as a political leader, and we could be talking about reconciliation, we could be talking about climate measures, we could be talking about transit expansion, or a number of other things. How do you find that balance uh, between providing current residents what they need and building a city that you know will appeal to the next generation? I think balance is the most overused weasel word in our business. <laughs> and, and I say that respectfully sure. because, because I know what you mean and you're looking for a deeper answer, but usually the answer is, oh, we'll balance these things, right? And, and I've, I'm getting really selective about when I talk about balance because it's, it's usually a way out of things that we actually have to have a really hard conversation about. And what we have to have... <laughs> thank you. What, what we have to have a really hard conversation about um, with respect to climate change is that, on the one hand, there is... 
I, I think what we're seeing in not just in Alberta, but, but in the West and in other resource producing communities all around the country. So this is not just a prairie thing, it's a, it's a mining town thing. Uh, it was fisheries in, on the East Coast. Like when your livelihood is for reasons you don't fully understand and what seem to be in the control of other people um, seems to be taken away from you, that's a very anger producing thing and I think it's important to acknowledge that that is the stage of grief that many people are at. Some people are at the stage of denial, some people are bargaining with panels. <laughs> some, I mean, everyone's going through different stages of accepting that there is a fundamental change happening um, in the world's energy system. And so to your point about um, the, the conservative uh, policy. I mean, it's not for me. I mean, I have an opinion, but it, it, the the commentators in the party itself have acknowledged that their weak policy on climate was an albatross for them in the election. And um, I said this to the prime minister after the election, because uh, we were talking about Western alienation. I said, "Well, here's the interesting thing: two thirds of the country voted for serious action on climate, which is basically everybody who voted for uh, not for the conservatives." And two-thirds of the country voted for a pipeline, which is everyone who voted for the Liberals and who voted for the Conservatives. And it shows that the country can figure this out. It's not stuck on a polarized yes or no on either one of those questions. Like our decision-making system actually worked there and said, well, we need this pipeline to move this product that we need today while we're making this transition. And by the way, we'd like a fair price for the stuff that people are buying for us now so that we don't have economically one hand tied behind our backs while we're making this transition to a lower carbon future. You can have a both end. It's not a balance between the two. It's a serious integration with some strategy behind it. But when it breaks down to fear that I'm not going to have a job next week, first of all, you're looking for someone to blame. And so there, it's, it's important to understand all that anger, but it's important not to indulge that anger or make anger-based decisions about our kids' future. Because that, that planetary system, that air shed, all of those systems are... Uh, one way that we looked at it a few years ago in the last environmental strategic plan is, you know, the Brundtland concept of sustainability, which is the balance, the three-legged stool, works for certain things, a, a, you know, economy, environment, society. You've got to keep all these in balance, right? And that's a, I was listening to something the other day, that's a very Western way of thinking, like, oh, we've got to get to the steady state. we just got to get back to equilibrium, dynamic equilibrium, it'll be okay. But way too much stuff is changing all the time to get to a stable equilibrium. You're talking about resiliency against change is, is now a more popular concept than sustainability. But it's not about balancing these pieces, it's about understanding how they fit together. And it's not that one trumps the other. And frankly, if your worldview is the most important thing is the economy and balancing today's financial books and you're prepared to borrow social capital by exploiting people, or borrow natural capital and run an environmental deficit, then you're not a real conservative. Because you're not looking after the future. You're not saving or leaving something better for the future. And so I think uh, conservation, which has the same root word in it, and, and the modern environmental movement was born from Republicans worried about headwater protection for the Hudson River so that New York could persist and thrive into the future. And so I, I actually put the challenge back to the movement uh, of conservatives picking their next leader to figure out what is not the false trade-off between now and the future and the economy and the environment, but how as Canadians can we lead in demonstrating that what we mean by both and, we can have a strong economy and mind the environment, is that we're going to commit not to run into deficit in the future uh, whether it's with our water or whether it's with our air, and that we're not going to mine our cities um, by leaving people behind, by marginalizing newcomers or marginalizing indigenous people or marginalizing women or marginalizing other minorities, that we're going to try to actually grow social capital and grow or maintain at least natural capital while we grow economic capital at the same time. I mean, I'd be really interested in that if someone can articulate all of that in a coherent way and win an election on it. I don't know if our political discourse is there yet, but the way I look at it is not that there you have this trade-off between the three that you have to somehow balance. It's that um, the economy is the wholly owned subsidiary of the society, and the society is the wholly owned subsidiary of nature. And if you lose nature, 
doesn't matter what your GDP figures are. It's not going to last very long, right? So you have, to, you have to be good stewards. And I think that can't be a partisan issue. That has to be a human priority. We're, we're going to move on uh, to, to live audience questions, but before we do, uh, and, and I'm going to take us just into overtime here for a couple of minutes, uh, I wanted to ask you too, Kaylin and Robin, uh, if you do perceive there to be a, a, a generational element or a generational divide, uh, and I don't ask this for purposes of division, uh, but do you perceive that to be the case with some of your priorities when you decide where you will build your career and perhaps raise a family? Yeah, um, well, just building on what was just said, um, I think for our generation it really feels like we have been left with a lot to clean up. Um, we have to solve the climate crisis because if we don't, by the end of our generation, there is no hope for our planet. We have to fix an economy that is not sustainable and we have to come to terms with hundreds of years of colonization and that's a lot to take on. But as a generation, I think that means that we understand that we don't want to leave the same kind of mess for our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. So through things like the city plan, um, planning for that long-term future and really focusing on stewardship, um, I think that makes our generation the most prepared to tackle these kind of things because we understand that future generations can't be put in the same position as we are. Hmm. Um. Um, I think that there is a divide. And to be honest, I wish it would go away. Like, I think that we really need to see that. <laughs> I think issues of the climate and the environment and sustainability, we need to start seeing this as a human right. You know, we have a right to have a sustainable environment. And I feel as if once we shift the narrative and we shift to that understanding that our right to have, you know, a healthy sustainable, thriving environment for us and our future generations and for the people who are, you know, going to go into retirement, <laughs> you know, by the nice beach or something like that. Like, these are all things that is a human right and that we should all acquire, you know. And I also think that we need to start having more constructive conversations about, and I know it, people always think, like, why do you always have to talk about things, right? But we all need to come to the similar understanding of why we're doing this work. You know, I know that Anger is not, you know, the most productive emotion, but it's a realistic one, right? Especially when you know that you're going to be losing your job or that's what, at the end of the day, <laughs> we are going to start, we, we hope to move away from, you know, oil and gas and we hope to go into like new economies. And I feel as if we need to really start talking about the reality and the future of these things. And maybe if it's not even a if it's not a plausible fear, we need to talk about why it isn't a plausible fear, right? But I don't think that the issue of climate and the environment should become a partisan issue anymore. Because at the end of the day, we are facing an emergency. The science backs it up, the economics backs it up, and we can see it, right? So I do think that there's a divide, and I really hope that future leaders, and even right now, we start to dismantle that and work together to solve this issue. That makes sense. Well, add one thing. I, I couldn't agree more and, and a couple things have given me hope um, that because we always have to be really careful about generalization mm. and, and I do think it is not a generalization but a fact that you're absolutely right. Your generation has been handed a giant set of deficits naturally, socially uh, and, and fiscally in a lot of cases and it's not fair. So it's, it's, it's fair to be angry about that. Um, but uh, the generalization that previous generations didn't care. I mean, you're here in the room and you're nodding and you're agreeing and you want to make change. People from all walks of life and all ages in this room. And so, so that can sometimes be heard as, I'm not part of the problem, I want to be part of the solution. You know, for, for even at 40, I'm feeling defensive now, right? <laughs> um, but but uh, a couple things give me hope uh, about this. One is that um, Mark Carney, who spent some time in Edmonton, so we're going to claim him as one of ours, um, is now the UN Special Envoy on Climate. So when the bankers 
and it's not just the investors, but the bankers are figuring out, okay, this is where this is where the puck is going to think to channel our inner Wayne Gretzky. That that means markets are going to transform, just like I was talking about the need for it's slow and you wish it was faster, but all of a sudden when it tips over and things change in marketplaces and the money is going to renewables and low carbon solutions and hydrogen economy and all these other things, when the money's going that way, the game changes. Now we don't want to be left behind. Um, but I think we can have a piece of that if we're intentional about it. The other thing that gives me hope, though, is that Tom Fath uh, won the um, Northern Lights Award at the Chamber of Commerce dinner the other night. I don't know how many of you were there at that dinner, but he got, he got up and he gave um, an acceptance speech. And the Fath group does a lot of paving and signs and, you know, real nuts and bolts stuff. And Tom's a wonderful guy and he owns FC Edmonton and, it's, and he's given so much to this community. Gives this acceptance speech. And I wasn't there, but I heard about it because this sent waves. Tom said, it's really important that we work hard to drive prosperity and create jobs and create wealth. But it's even more important that we do our very best to tackle climate change and make sure that we don't have a collapse of biodiversity. And this is a seasoned business leader and respected, um, probably 70-some-year-old Edmontonian who said this to the Chamber of Commerce audience. So this is breaking through into those rooms from all ages, from all ages. Thanks for that. Uh, I don't know about you, but what an incredible panel we have here. Uh, we do recognize, yeah, let's recognize them. Uh, if you look here, uh, you can see there are two microphones on, on either side of the aisle, about a third of the way up. Uh, here's how we're going to do this. We're going to ask you if you do have a question for our panel to please line up in single file behind one of those microphones. Uh, please state your name and your question when prompted. Uh, keep your questions short, please, and on topic. Uh, we ask that your comment not be a personal statement, but a question that you think that the audience might find to be interesting and relevant. Uh, please respect the speakers and other audience members by not asking follow-up questions. I'm one to talk. But uh, step to the side once you've asked your question. Allow the person behind you to step forward to the microphone. We'll do our best to get through all of the questions. Uh, do we have someone that would like to go ahead and ask our first question? Please go ahead. Hey, uh, Misha Shinkovsky, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, thanks so much, Robin, Kalen, and uh, your worship. I got that right, right? <laughs> Yeah. No one actually worships me. Is exactly <laughs> uh, you spoke about the period in the 90s, you know, a period of, I guess we could call it austerity at the municipal level. I'm um, just wondering if you're seeing any parallels now and what we can do, aside from the obvious, which is to vote so that it doesn't happen again. <laughs> so um, um, I got a I'll answer it this way. I got a chance to interview Bill Nye. Were any of you at the Bill Nye show? Uh, couple months ago. It was awesome. It was a great talk that he gave. And um, he, uh, I got to ask him part of that same question. I said, what's the most important single thing uh, you can do to take action on climate change? And he just said, vote. Period. And he's, he's, he gives even longer answers than I do to tough questions. And I thought he really nailed it there. So your, your activism as citizens, not just at elections, but between is, is going to be critical. Um, and we are entering a, a tricky time um, in, in a lot of ways, and I'm still wrapping my, heads around some, my head around some of it, and we're gonna see what happens in the next budget. Um, the, the previous budget obviously hit uh, a lot of people hard in different ways, students, seniors, um, people with uh, uh, prescriptions that, are, uh, that they're gonna lose, uh, people on age, you know, I, I think that's not the best way to balance a budget, but I don't get to make that decision. I didn't run for the legislature. Um, so what I get to influence and not control, because it takes at least six other votes uh, to get things done at city council, is, is what I've tried to influence um, with, with a lot of support from a very thoughtful council is to try to soft land through, through these fiscal changes. Um, and, and we've had to make some very difficult decisions without moving into overcorrecting into austerity. So it's certainly a time of restraint. Um, and we were able to, you know, we started a 2.6% tax increase. The downloads and, and cuts and other issues that the province hit us would have, if we'd touched nothing, moved us to 4.3. Uh, and we managed to get down to just under 2.1. Um, recognizing the dire straits that lots of people are in because of the economic situation. And so we were able to absorb some, 
Um, but I can't absorb that every year without laying people off and uh, contributing to that um, erosion of consumer confidence and housing market stability and other things in the city. And, and quite frankly, this, there's still 10 or 20,000 people a year showing up demanding services from the city of Edmonton. It's not like I can get by with less firefighters and uh, less librarians and less police officers just because the economy is where it is, right? People still need those services. In a lot of cases, demand for those services go up, particularly frontline services. And people need libraries in particular now more than ever, but they need all of those suite of public services. So we, we need to be uh, counter-cyclical or at least not get uh, overcorrected. So you're not seeing that happening with Edmonton City Hall right now. I don't know what's going to happen in the next election. You know, forces are mustering who, who think that we, uh, that taxes are too high and don't want to have conversations about cost drivers over the last 15 years and don't want to look at um, longitudinally our fiscal policy correction and, and just want to go to the very easy, well, let's just cut and lower taxes. And we did that in the 90s. And frankly, so many people have come here since we had that experience. Not everybody remembers. That's why I have to keep repeating the story of the cost of the, sh the long term cost of that short term savings. Um, so I don't want to go in that direction. That's not where our council's gone. So, so we're not going there as a city, uh, but we'll see what happens in the next provincial budget, what kind of additional pressure the city's under and the community's under. Over here, please. Thank you. Oh, strong way on. Hello, hello. There we go. Thank you. Uh, Dave Onishanko. Um, I want to talk about housing affordability and I'd appreciate answers from all three of you working in the development industry for the past uh, X number of years. This is a comment that comes up time and time again, both from the people putting houses in the ground to social activists, to everyone in between. And as you can see across global cities and especially in North America, where you see some of our larger cities having issues, extreme issues with housing affordability, where do you see us building um, housing for the next million people? And maybe through the lens of both supply and demand, through housing typologies, through carrots and sticks, but to continue, I, what I would say is part of the, one of the advantages of Edmonton is that affordable housing and what we can do to ensure that and better that. Absolutely, affordable housing is one of the most important things that will attract and retain young people to come to this city. Um, I think one of the biggest things is allowing for flexibility in our planning systems to have the type of housing that matches the demands of young people. That might mean apartment buildings with no underground parking and that lowers the cost of the units that you have above ground. Um, that might mean locating it next to high density transit where um, there is a lot of demand for that kind of housing so that we can access the places we want to go um, without needing to move out to the suburbs. And it's unfortunate right now that affordable housing in Edmonton often means moving farther away from the core and that's something that I'd like to see changed. I agree. Um, I do think that affordability for housing is an issue and when I asked people about how, asked youth about how Edmonton could be better for youth, that was the main problem. Um, I'd like to just see us reimagine, I guess, how we, like what, what we think the ideal house is. I know when we were doing our city plan um, preparation, I guess, we were talking about how it would be nice to diversify the types of housing there, have more high rises, have more, um, just diversity in the different types of housing that we offer. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, I'll yeah, i leave it at that. <laughs> so um, thanks, Dave. And, and uh, that is a competitive differentiator for us, and we absolutely don't want to lose that. Um, it's one of the contributing factors to the great food scene and art scene that we have here is that we have relatively high disposable incomes and relatively affordable housing compared to other major Canadian cities, such that when you take what's left, we have the highest disposable income in the country. And that's one of the things that supports a great um, and, and thriving small business scene here and art scene and all those other things is that spending power. You start to erode that as people move into house, house poverty, like in Vancouver, where there's no money left after you pay the mortgage. Then you get you know, the kind of street life and cultural life um, that you would expect if people don't have a lot of extra money. So, so that's uh, a contributing factor to quality of life here and and it's just attractive on the on the numbers so we do want to maintain that and I think um, we need to 
do that, or one of the one of the ways that the market is already doing this is by attaching rather than detaching. And the simple economics of it are that if you share a wall, then there's that much less vinyl siding, <laughs> which is a good thing. Um, and uh, but when when you share construction, uh, there's some efficiencies both both in original construction, both in the cost of land in between, which is just dirt. You're spending a lot of money to have dirt between you and the next house. And it is possible to build attached houses. They had people live in them all over the world where you don't hear or smell your neighbors. <laughs> Uh, builders in Edmonton can do this too, and are, and building just extraordinary houses and um, that are lovely and don't have side yards, which nothing grows in there anyway. It's just like the place you push your lawnmower through, right? Um, so, but it's all, they're also cheaper to heat. And so I think the market's already uh, uh, attached, has outsold detached for almost a decade now, I think. So the market's already there for most first-time buyers are forced to that with the housing market where it is today. Now, one of the other things that I think um, we can get a bit creative about is uh, there's a lot of talk about the mortgage stress test and a request to have the feds back off the stress test so that we can just start borrowing and building like we were before. Except if that's contrary to our city plan goals, but it's also constraining people from home ownership and, and forcing them into sort of lifelong renting and not having that wealth building opportunity, then how could we astutely unlock the financing? And if we put our Mark Carney hat on here and say, okay, what policy objectives can we achieve while easing more um, uh, liquidity into the housing market? One of the no-brainer things I've been advocating for some time to the feds is, um, you, you know the mileage of your car, but you don't know the mileage of your house automatically. So as a matter of consumer protection, I think you should know the energy efficiency of your largest purchase. Uh, so there should be mandatory energy labeling, and we're moving in that direction finally from a regulatory point of view. But then if you know that and you know the square footage of the house, you can model, roughly speaking, what your utility bills are going to be. And if you've, got, if you've paid extra for a really well-insulated house with triple glazed windows and shared walls with your neighbors, um, and solar panels on the roof, of course that's going to cost extra. You should be able to borrow more on a premise that your utility bills are going to be lower. You can divert what would have been a utility payment with a carbon footprint attached to it probably over to a lower carbon wealth creating um, investment in your single largest asset for most households. So I think we can get actually quite creative on some of these things while supporting people's ability to still achieve home ownership. It'll just look different than how it did in the 80s here, when everybody could have a big house on a big lot for 100,000 bucks. That's not coming back. <laughs> as angry as you get, that's not coming back. Jeff Davis, yay Councillor Knack. Uh, yay pass for people, yay bike lanes, and yay to the gentleman across the way for bringing up housing. Uh, further to what you said, I live in a neighborhood that has a lot of the construction you just talked about going on, but first comes a great big digger, takes a perfectly good house, reduces it to splinter, piles it in a handful of dumpsters, and they send it to one of those aways that we don't uh, pay too much attention to. And what I'd like to know is what can we do, what can the city do to make it as easy as possible for somebody to bring a great big saw in, chop the house off its foundations, put it on a trailer, and send it off to some place that could use an instant house. So it can be done with regula regulatory, it can be done with doing something tax-wise, doing something with permit-wise, doing something to make it easy to lift the, the uh, utility wires out of the way. I'm not sure if we can cut a house and move it. I like the idea. Um, it but happens just, a lot. If, yeah. But it could happen more. <laughs> just something bouncing off of that, though, is I think we can do more to increase the sustainability and accessibility of like modular housing options. Um, I live in a house that was modular, um, built elsewhere, brought in a lot less of that kind of footprint of bringing in materials from all over the world and assembling it on a property. Um, but also like changes in the zoning regulations that allow uh, for tiny houses and different kind of housing options um, that let more people live on uh, lots, having different kind of subdivision options, just more flexibility for those kind of uh, different types of sustainable housing forms. So, so it does happen from time to time, but it's not very convenient and it's very expensive to do that and you've got to have someone who wants the house at the other end. So, I mean, I'm thinking, I don't want to jump all to solutions about a matching service and where do you move that house. 
But your point is that there's a thing that has value that's being wasted in the process. Now, that's a private landowner's decision, and I, I'm not going to I don't think there's room for the city to come in and regulate that. But this is why even the carbon price conversation is so important because sending, you can either regulate with the long arm of government and say you shall or you shall not, or you can only do it under these conditions. And how do you all feel about it when we do that? Not so good, right? But there's in creative incentive structures so that maybe we're not charging enough to take all of that stuff to the dump because it's hazardous and it's got issues. and so. Uh, but maybe that's because it's too cheap for us to just pile it up in a, in a, in a landfill right now. So what is the chain of um, price signals and regulations that you need to make it so you think twice about just tearing it down and pulverizing it and sending it away so that it's all of a sudden relatively attractive to say, well, I'd like to, you know, I can pay this much to demolish it and have it hauled away, or I can, you know, kind of like the Kidney Foundation answer to your wrecked car to say, I want this house taken away. Will you give me a tax credit for it so I can avoid, you know, it's, it's about incentives as much as regulation. And, and so I think we are going to see huge turnover in the building stock because you and I might love the mid-century modern house from the 50s, but it may not be particularly energy efficient. It may not be the shape and size uh, for... Um, a family that, that is looking for a, a certain different thing and it's like build something different on their property. But, but I think uh, not just for houses but for all kinds of other things that have future economic life if we could figure out how to, how to facilitate a transaction for this thing that might have value for someone to get over somewhere else. Again, there's a lot of, a lot of work to do that but we need a lot more of that and, and what that's, uh, this is the light bulb's finally coming on, sorry, it's taken a while here. That's called the circular economy. So when uh, um, things have to go back somewhere and you as the consumer have to be accountable, not just for getting it, but where it goes next, now you have a stake in making sure that it's um, not just disposable, but potentially has new life. And there are companies, a friend of mine was telling me about this the other day, um, in Europe that are renting jeans because they're doing closed loop recycling jeans. So when your jeans wear out, you send them back and they shred them and they turn them into new jeans. And so you lease, you're on a lease to never own. You just, the, you just pass through these jeans. It's like, like I was saying earlier, it's all connected, man. Like. <laughs> Hi, I'm Josh. Um, so I'm convinced, I'm a believer. I think we can have a vibrant, dense, and efficient city if our population doubles. What if it doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> we can have a vibrant, less dense, efficient city of 1.5 million people. So, no, I, but I think at the root of your question is, is uh, what if, for economic reasons or other reasons, um, we don't see that kind of growth or negative growth, which is the euphemism for people actually leave faster than they're coming, you know, the Detroit problem. Somebody ran on making sure Edmonton didn't turn on into Detroit. Um, anyway, that's another story, but uh, you remember. Anyway, um, so, so how do, I mean, obviously everything we're talking about here in terms of vibrancy and quality of life and culture, those are things that we want to be net attractors because fundamentally people are choosing between if they have all the options in the world, about 600 different cities of a million or more that exist in the world today, over the next 30 years, there'll probably be another three or 400 cities that get to that size, some which don't even exist yet. Uh, but in other parts of the world where they can build hospitals in three days, you know, cities of a million people spring up in a couple of years. I've seen some of them. They're unbelievable, right? That's who we're competing with. So we need to be the kind of place that people are going to want to be at. Uh, and those are a lot of the intangibles. Um, but, but some people have advocated for that, that we should be planning for a zero growth scenario and for a, for a, a decline scenario. Um, I'm not ready to go there yet, but it, it does need to be in the back of our mind. And I think if, it, if things go in a different direction, then obviously we'd have to rescale our aspirations in a whole bunch of different ways. So I still think you can have a great city. Um, and there's actually a ton of cities in the, in the U.S., and this is where I got to know Pete Buttigieg a little bit, who's also running for president, is, um, um, you know, South Bend, Indiana, their big company was Studebaker, and they don't make Studebakers anymore, if you know. Um, and he announced his bid in the old Studebaker factory and talked about what they've done to take the deindustrialized city and make it relevant and have it grow again. 
so I think um, uh, I think that even if the fundamentals change and we were to go through a dip, and there was one year where population went down in Edmonton, I think it was 1993. So, so um, since we started, we've been on the way up except for one year. So I'm going to hold on that trend line, but it's a really important question because you can't take it for granted. Uh, we are about 13 minutes over the allotted time. We do have a reception Sorry. to get to. My so, bad. so I want no, I, I want to apologize to everybody. We're going to leave standing, but we do have time for one final question over here. Thank you. My name is Dave Bjorkman. Nice to see you, Mayor Iverson. I have one really fundamental question, and, and the youth can look at this too, and this is our federal government and the funding that Edmonton and Calgary both receive being substantially less than every major municipality in Canada. Edmontonians, we're almost at one million people now. The amount of federal taxation that we put out to Confederation, Edmontonians specifically and Calgarians get about seven cents on the dollar back. It's substantially less, and I've gone through the paperwork of this major municipality and grants, federal funding, I know for your LRT project, Green Line in Calgary, but what Vancouver gets in comparable population, we go per person per capita, we don't compare. And this Western alienation, I just want to know from our city councils, why don't we go to federal Ottawa and start demanding a fair shake, especially for Edmontonians? Seven cents on the dollar is what you get back. Well, I'm flying to Ottawa on Tuesday, <laughs> if that helps. <laughs> and as, uh, as chair of the big city mayor's uh, group within the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, um, we work with the other mayors to try to make sure that all the cities and, and frankly, uh, counties and small towns are getting a fair shake, and that's why things like the, the gas tax transfer, which doesn't have anything to do with the gas tax anymore, but it's a dedicated federal infrastructure transfer, uh, comes fairly inequitably to, to municipalities large and small across the country, and we think that's fair and we think that should grow. And so that's not about a, an Alberta thing in particular, um, because I, th I think, I, I hear the point that Albertans contribute more when times are good, and times are not good, so we'd like some of it back. Um, but we've got to also back up to the 1930s when Alberta was the poorest province in Confederation, and um, we were being looked after uh, with a lot of stimulus and investment from the federal government. Now, there may be very few people alive who remember that, but it's come and gone over time. And um, I think, I guess, I don't, I, I'm not convinced that the city of Edmonton is, is uh, not being fairly uh, treated by the federal government relative to other cities. The one exception is that the big transit funds go disproportionately because of the ridership model. And that's just on a continuum, because if you're building bus rapid transit in a city of 500,000, that's you know, $10 million a kilometer. If you're building light rail in a city uh, of around a million like us, or Calgary, or Hamilton, or, or, uh, or anywhere else that's building light rail, it's sort of $100 million a kilometer. And if you're building subways in Vancouver, or in Toronto, or Montreal, it's kind of a billion dollars a kilometer. So there is an exponential investment um, and the transit money does flow disproportionately that way but I'm okay with that I, the, the mayor's worked that out with the federal government so there's no sleight of hand there there's a, an appropriate allocation of natu national resources to uh, the largest cities and the mid-sized cities so they can grow into needing subway systems 20 or 30 or 40 years from now so I, I'm not convinced that municipally we're being treated badly as to Albertans thinking that we pay too much into the country, I think um, we, I, quite frankly, my answer is we need to be able to pay our own bills because there's not a lot of sympathy for us in the rest of the country, to be honest with you, that we can't balance our books with all this prosperity that we have. Not a popular view, I recognize, but... <laughs> well, I, I'd like to thank... Uh, uh, incredible panelists, uh, Robin Taylor, uh, Kaylin Kufajnakis, and uh, Mayor Don Iverson. And uh, at this point, we'll hand things back to Tina Thomas. 
So thank you again, as Ryan said, what an amazing discussion, giving us so many things to think about. There was definitely a key theme about density, compact city, transit, love the focus on affordable, convenient, um, easy to use. Um, but what I love that you all did, and I hope that we all love that you did this, is you focused on the why that sometimes gets lost, that it builds a city that is more like a community, that's sustainable, that it attracts young people, um, that it's walkable, um, all those things that make a, commu a community what it needs to be. Um, and libraries absolutely make communities walkable, so I hope to see a library in every one of those new neighborhoods that's built for two million people. <laughs> Our forward-thinking speaker series conversations continue with author Tanya Talaga on Wednesday, April 22nd. She is the first Ojibwe woman to deliver the CBC Massey Lectures and is an acclaimed storyteller. So we hope you'll join us for what will be a fantastic event. Tickets go on sale Wednesday, March 4th, uh, and you can see information on our website. Before we wrap up, I'd like to once again thank our partner, the City of Edmonton, as well as our event sponsor, CPA Alberta, as well as our media sponsor, Avenue Magazine. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you for your ongoing support of EPL, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks.